put in this hewn out tomb basically for the corpse to rot. After better than a year, uh, maybe even a couple of years, after the corpse has completely uh, decomposed and all that's left is bones, then normal Jewish practice was to go in and gather up the bones that were left and place them in a, in a box called an ossuary. And then the box was put in a niche in a wall or it was buried or something like that. Uh, but the body didn't stay in the grave that it was originally put in. And this, this had been Jewish practice for a long time. E even Joseph, uh, Joseph's bones were carried out of, uh, carried by the children of Israel uh, so when they left Egypt. So, um, in, a, in a box, in an ossuary. So this is, this is a long-held Jewish practice. By the way, I had this conversation with somebody the other day, too, talking about funeral practices. Um, we have a kind of growing trend towards cremation in our culture. Christians have traditionally resisted this. Uh, the purpose of the trend is more or less just financial because it's so much cheaper to be cremated than go through a whole prolonged funeral uh, with embalming and a big casket and all of that business. Uh, so they choose what's most economically feasible. But Christians have resisted this, um, not because the Bible flat out says it's sinful, but because, because of a fundamental respect for the body that Christianity has that other religions don't. Uh, we recognize that, that the flesh is important to God. The body is important to God. Christ was born into the flesh. You know, he was resurrected in the flesh. Uh, his body was buried. He was raised from the dead, both body and soul. Uh, he will resurrect us in the flesh. The body matters to God. And in fact, in the New Testament, the body is called the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when the body dies, Christians have historically preserved the body intact and just laid it in the earth. Sort of uh, like, uh, uh, like God said to, dust, to, to Adam, from dust you were taken to dust you will return. So uh, we, we turn the body back over to the earth from which it was taken. But historically, Christians turned the whole body. We don't destroy it. Uh, we let nature do that. Uh, is it sinful if somebody is cremated? And I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the best practice for us as Christians is to consider burial, not cremation. And there are cheaper ways to do a burial. There's nothing wrong with doing it the way the Jews did it. In terms of, you don't need embalming. It's just Get buried without being embalmed. That's where a lot of the money is. You don't need a big fancy casket. That's where the most money is in a funeral. Thousands on caskets. Uh, you, can, you can still buy wooden boxes. They're out there. You know, very simple casket. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, why, for sake, why spend all that money and then bury it for Pete's sakes? Uh, I'm all for a wooden box. Is there a law? No, I actually checked with Mark uh, Bokey about that. Uh, there's no law that you have to be embalmed, and there's no law that you have to have a casket, or a vault for that matter. The, the vault is just the normal practice up here at the Hubbard Cemetery. I don't. Yeah, I think, I think if you're embalmed, they remove your blood. Otherwise, I don't think they remove all your blood. Um, you could always do what they did in medieval times, though, and have a bell outside the casket and a little rope going inside, so if you wake up, you just ring the bell. And... Well, now you could just be buried with your cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when the body is buried, it eventually deteriorates to dust anyway. Mm-hmm. That's one way of looking at it, yes, and, and, and there are those who do. I mean, part of the funeral rite is ashes to ashes, dust to dust, you know, and, it, and yeah, I mean, ultimately it gets you in the same place. You dissolve into nothingness, into, into, into dust. Uh, but, you know, still, even so, there were, the, the practice of cremation was actually around the Jews um, during both Old Testament and New Testament times. It was a practice known to them, and they, they resisted it. 
again, because of the statement that burning a body makes uh, as opposed to burying a body. It does say something different theologically. Would I do a service? Yeah, we would, and we have. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, not saying it's a sin. I'm just saying, as Christians, we should think about things other than just pure financial issues when it comes to something like that, that even burying is a confession of faith. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm definitely in favor of a cheaper burial. Don't spend the money on embalming or a fancy casket. In fact, you can, you can actually bring the price below cremation just by being buried. I think there's time limits. I think if you choose to uh, not be embalmed, I think you have to be buried within a certain amount of time legally. I think it's 48 hours. 48 hours, okay, yeah. So it would be a rather quick yeah. funeral once you were dead. And that's kind of the problem is you got people all over the, yeah. all over the country too. Yep, all right. All right, so that's a little, little off topic, but nonetheless, still something to think about. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here, uh, the second asterisk, uh, the normal funerary practice back then. As soon as death was certain, the deceased's eyes were closed, the corpse was washed, and then wrapped and bound. According to third century Jewish tractate, men only could prepare the corpse of a man but women could prepare both men and women. Perfumes or ointments were used for this washing. So these things normally happened before the body was buried. But again, with Jesus' case, it was different because it all happened so fast. He, he, he died and was essentially quickly wrapped in this cloth and put into the grave. So it's, and, it, and then the next day is a Sabbath day, so they couldn't go back and make it right then. They had to wait to the next day which is when the women go out there to finish the proper funerary practices. So Luke 23, then he took it down, oh, this is, this is the first burial. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, that's the body of Jesus, laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of rock where no one had ever lain before. That was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near, and the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. In Mark 16, now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Uh, and this is more than an anointing. This is the proper burial rite then that they were going to do for him. They were going to uh, wash him, perfume him with all the various spices, properly wrap him in the linen strips, you know, give, give him the burial that a, a Jewish person would normally be given. Uh, uh, then the asterisk is after that. The burial washing was happening two days later because of the haste which Jesus was taken down on Friday. Um, Next, some tombs included an area for lamenting the deceased, made up of either a circle of benches or a row, or rows of seats. These mourning enclosures are usually situated in front of and around the entrance of the tomb. Matthew records Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting in such a place. So if you look at the very first quotation on this page for Matthew 27, the last verse says, and Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. That's the sitting place for mourning, uh, which shows, again, this is a rich man's grave uh, because the, the poor would not have a sitting place for you to go and mourn this, this person in the tomb. So after allowing time for total decomposition, it was typical for the bones to be disinterred and played in a smaller box, as we said. Uh, last asterisk, the large stone door was a deterrent both to grave robbers and predators. It was not easily moved, as we shall see. Page two, very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? So the first day of the week, Sunday, and who will roll away the stone shows the size of the stone and the difficulty in moving it. Three women could not move it together. There were at least three women that came out. 
And, and I'm sure they were not weak women. And they could not move it together. So this is an extremely heavy and awkward thing to move. Luke 24, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Uh, John, as typical, has a very different angle on it. One of the things you'll see when we're, we're about to look at all four of the resurrection uh, occurrences in the, in the Gospels, one of the things you see is the, how different they all are. Each one emphasizes a different aspect of it. Uh, John's is the most difficult to reconcile with the other three because it's so different. Uh, but I do think there's a way that it fits in with the whole story um, along with the other three and doesn't contradict them, as we'll see here. So here's John's account of it all. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. So they both ran together, oh, I just read that, and so he stooping down and looking in saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, this appears, on first reading anyway, that John has Mary Magdalene going to the tomb alone. First day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. We don't have any mention of any of the other women. Doesn't mean they're not there. Just means John's not mentioning her, mentioning them. John also states that it was before sunlight. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. But... If you look over at Mark 16 on the other page that we just read, uh, did we read that? No, we didn't. Look on Mark 16, Mark 16 on the next page it is. Mark 16, 2. Um, Mark says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. So Mark says when the sun had risen... John says, when it was still dark. So, aha, there we go again, another biblical contradiction showing the Bible does in fact contradict itself and it's not perfect. So how do you answer that? John says it was dark, Mark says it was light. Maybe it was sunrise. And she left when it was dark and got there when it was light. I mean, it was a walk. It was a walk from Jerusalem out there. I'm not normally up that time in the morning, but I would assume it. sun comes up pretty quickly. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's no reason why they both can't be right. That, again, she starts off so early that it's dark. She gets there right at daylight just to, uh, you know, it, it still fits in fine. And the fact that, that there are no other women mentioned doesn't mean there weren't other women there. It simply means John is focusing his story on Mary Magdalene. And there's a reason why John focuses his story on Mary Magdalene, because she's the first one to see the risen Christ, which is exactly what he goes into then right after this bit, how Jesus appears to her and, and she confronts him. So John is focusing on her for a purpose. She is the first witness to the resurrection. So she's kind of the one that matters most to him as he's telling the story. 
Uh, also, Peter and John seem to be the second to the tomb. John isn't mentioned, by the way. It always says the other disciple here. This is, this is typical of John. John never mentions himself by name. And, and many believe that's a mark of humility in him, that he considers himself not even worthy to mention his own name, kind of writes himself out of the story. But that other disciple is John. So Peter and John are the second to the tomb. They don't see an angel. They do, however, see the cloths lying there and specifically mentions the head, the head uh, handkerchief that had been around the head lying not with the lid and cloths but folded together in a place by itself. What does that suggest about the, the nature of the resurrection? The, the cloth is folded. Jesus took the time to fold it. He didn't just kind of, you know, poof, resurrect, and all the, cl all the claws that were wrapped around him just kind of fell into a void and were laying there in the shape of his body in the tomb. The cloths are removed and folded. Yeah, he, the resurrection was, you know, like somebody getting up in the morning and folding your clothes and putting on your other clothes, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't a uh, chaotic, zombie-ish kind of thing. It was very orderly, very uh, neat. Jesus was in complete control. Uh, yeah, it just, it just says something about everything is decent and in order in this process. Uh, yeah. I know you haven't mentioned it, but the way that then it would be in complete control, the shroud of Turin, as supposedly that was what it was wrapped in. Right. They say that there was a cataclysmic something happened, a flash, mm -hmm. is what they try to say. This goes just to the opposite, that he was in control, just set up, Nice and casual. Set up, remove the wrappings and folded things and put them back. Yeah, that Shroud of Turin thing is, is you know, definitely weird. I'll, I'll grant you that. Uh, to my knowledge, all the carbon dating that's been done on it places it in medieval times, not in the first century. Um, so I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that as being the cloth Jesus was wrapped in but it's definitely curious. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a mystery, but again, I, I really don't put a whole lot of stock in the thing. Any other thoughts? All right, so, so the resurrection presents itself in a very orderly term. It's not chaos. Uh, it's Jesus is in complete control of everything. He even takes the time to fold things and lay them there when he gets up out of the tomb. Um, but the, there is chaos, and that's among the disciples, the followers of Jesus, not Jesus himself, because they don't get it. The chaos is due to their, to their lack of faith. As John points out, um, that they did not yet they, they didn't yet understand, even though it says in verse 8, the other disciple, John, came to the tomb first, went in, he saw and believed. But what exactly did he believe? He may have believed that Jesus rose, but it does make the point that as of yet they did not understand the scripture. Um, so... Verse 9, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So it's, you wonder what it is he saw and believed if they didn't understand that this was the biblical promise of the resurrection. At any rate, there is utter chaos between the followers of Jesus. And even though they're seeing and believing, what they're believing is at question. Now, Matthew's account, and just notice the, the great difference here. Now, after the Sabbath... As the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. 
His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Now, notice some differences already. In John's gospel, it, when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, it simply says she saw the stone was taken away and ran and told Simon Peter. There's no mention of a, of a meeting of angels at this point yet. It's like she saw the empty tomb and ran immediately back to the disciples. But again, John is leaving out significant parts of the story because that's not his focus. His focus is on how she's the first witness of the resurrection. But Matthew adds in other details. First, when they came, it wasn't just Mary Magdalene. He writes the other Mary. Uh, and now we have this confrontation with an angel. Page 3. Uh, Mark's account. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, now we have three women, brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Uh, now we have three women, uh, a little different conversation with the angel. And now Luke's account. Now the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what happened. All right, now we've got two angels suddenly in Luke, and the crowd in verse 10 has grown. Mary Magdalene, now we have Joanna. Now, either Joanna's another name for Salome, or she's a fourth woman who's there. Mary, the mother of James. All right, so Matthew alone tells us how the guards fainted when the angel appears. There's no other a gospel that records that. Uh, next, Matthew and Mark have one angel in the tomb. Luke and John have two angels. Thing is, though, Matthew and Mark, or, or Matthew and uh, Mark, yes, that have one angel, don't say there was, you know, no other angels. It just says that one of the angels was there and talked to him. And that's, uh, that's the point. There was more than one angel, only one was doing the talking, so they just mention an angel, not the fact that there was another one standing by there who evidently was looking on. Um, John has an angel engage Mary Magdalene in conversation, who's alone at the tomb. Matthew and Mark and Luke all have an angel simply making a statement to the group of women that included Mary Magdalene. And John does not include the entire statement by the angel. In fact, 
John doesn't even mention this part of the angel statement. Next, Luke has Peter running to the tomb after all the women came back and told the disciples about their encounter with the angels in the open tomb. So, in the end of Luke, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by himself. There's no mention of John in this, going with him. And also, this seems to happen after the conversation with the angels. Now, again, how, is this, how do we fit John into this whole thing? Because John has Mary Magdalene going by herself, not seeing any angels, coming back, talking to Peter and John, who run there, don't see any angels, and then... Mary Magdalene has a conversation with an angel, sees an angel and has a conversation. See, I think John's account is primarily talking about after the, this first group of women. I think Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this first group of women going out to the tomb. They are confronted by the angels. They go back, tell Peter and John what's happening, or Peter and the rest of the disciples. Peter and John get up, and this is where the Gospel of John comes in. Now they all run to the tomb together, and Mary Magdalene follows them. They look in, don't see anything. The men leave. Mary Magdalene stands behind, and she sees the angel again. In John, verse 11, Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, stood down, looked in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting. So she's to the tomb twice. Once with all the woman, women, once by herself. And that's how John fits in, even though the story is so different. It doesn't contradict the other ones. It just tells a different side, a different, a different part in the progression than the other ones focus on. So then it's at that point where Mary Magdalene is alone at the tomb, sees the angels, and then will see Christ himself alone. Mark, let's see, does it say that? I will get to that. Yeah, Mark will point that out, that it's Mary Magdalene who sees Jesus alone, even though Mark tells the story from, again, a different perspective of all the women going to the tomb. He doesn't mention the fact that Mary went back again another time and this time saw Jesus. Uh, John 20, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus. There, there, it, there it is, standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and saw him and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Uh, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So only John records the event of Jesus meeting Mary Magdalene. Though again, Mark alludes to it. And here's the citation from Mark. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. So after Mark goes through the whole story of the women seeing the angels and going back and telling the disciples, Mark does acknowledge the fact that Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene alone. He just doesn't tell the story. That's where John's gospel picks it up and tells it. So there is no contradiction between these gospel accounts. They're just all telling different parts of the progression of the story. And it's chaos among the disciples, which itself says something. Uh, first asterisk. Mark's statement is especially important because he records that Mary was with the other women at the tomb. So if Mark also speaks of Jesus appearing to her alone, he's admitting that he hasn't told everything that happened. And next, the differences in the story again point to the reliability of the stories. Yeah, instead of seeing these differences as proof that the Bible contradicts itself, it's actually proof that the Bible's a very reliable account of these things. Uh, it shows the early Christians did not try and alter the stories to make them all agree seamlessly. They left the stories alone so that they were all different, proving they left them alone. And it also points to the chaos of Easter morning. And it's the chaos of unbelief. Had they, had they believed what Jesus taught them before, 
that you know, destroyed this temple in three days, I'll raise it again. Had they, had they believed his teaching on the resurrection, Easter wouldn't have been a surprise. They would have been expecting it. So it was unbelief causing the chaos, not re the resurrection itself. Um, I don't think she believed it any more than anybody else did because she was going out there to start with looking for a dead body. Uh, and when she sees the gardener, she says, where you've taken his body because I want it back. You know, so she's still looking for a dead, dead body. So just um, Jesus, I see it more as a, a reversal of the Garden of Eden. You know, the promise, the first gospel promise was given to the woman. I'll put enmity between your seed and her seed. It was given, you know, spoken to the devil, but it was a promise ultimately for the woman's seed. Um, because it was the woman who, who first fell into sin. It was the woman who received the promise of the Messiah be, to be born from her to fix her sin. And now here, it's to a woman that he appears first to announce his resurrection, ultimate victory over the devil. So it's like he's ending, finishing his conversation with Eve, that I've, I've fixed it now, you know. You're, you're safe. So, yeah, I mean, women feature very prominently in the, the whole resurrection story, and they are the first witnesses to the resurrection, the first bearers of the gospel back to the disciples, saying he's risen. Uh, some points. The, the resurrection which we kind of take for granted in our day and age, was considered an extremely <clears throat> edgy and radical teaching back in the first century. Uh, and it featured prominently as like the main thing that the disciples would point to. It was also, uh, it was also a, a, a teaching that was corrupted by certain other teachers who were denying the resurrection, which happened even before Jesus was resurrected. The Sadducees, as an example, denied the resurrection. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, we see the resurrection uh, and dealing with those who denied it. Uh, how important the resurrection is. You know, if the resurrection is the linchpin of our faith, if the resurrection didn't happen, the whole point of Christianity is meaningless. This is what Paul says. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead did not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So th there you go. The resurrection is the linchpin of the faith. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you're, you're lost to God. If there is no resurrection, none of us can be saved. It is, uh, it is particularly important to note that a lot of, of liberal scholars, and in fact liberal pastors today, deny the bodily resurrection. They claim that the resurrection was only a spiritual event. Jesus spiritually rose from the grave, but his body didn't. That's a fundamental denial of the resurrection, and as what Paul says there, it makes your entire faith futile and pointless. If Christ's body didn't rise from the dead, nothing Jesus was about matters. So it, it featured that, in, that centrally in the early apostolic teaching. Uh, when Jesus taught about the resurrection, he taught that there was a resurrection both to life and to condemnation. And there's uh, John 5 is the citation for that. To Mark, Luke, John 5, 28 to 29. 
Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Uh, so this clear teaching that the resurrection will include both the saved and the unsaved, but the unsaved will be condemned in their resurrected bodies. Uh, the resurrection was the focus of early apostolic preaching. Uh, we see it in Paul's preaching, we see it at Pentecost, we see it throughout Acts when it talks about the apostles uh, going out and, and spreading the gospel. What they were spreading was word of the resurrection in Christ. Uh, the early Christians connected baptism to the resurrection. Uh, both Peter and Paul do this quite clearly. So look in the Peter verse first. 1 Peter 3.21. And how, how important it is to, to see this link and how much worse it makes those who say that baptism is basically meaningless and doesn't give grace. Ultimately, they're not just denying a rite or a ritual. They're, they're saying something negative about the resurrection itself. So 1 Peter 3.21 uh, there is also an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. An antitype is the referent. A type is the thing which points to the referent. So there's an antitype. There is a there is a, a referent that saves us. There's a main thing that saves us, namely baptism, and it saves us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism joins us to the resurrection. Romans does the same thing. Paul in his teaching, Romans 6, uh, and in fact, Paul will take it a step further and say that baptism not only joins us to the resurrection, it also joins us to the death of Christ. Uh, verse 3, chapter 6 in Romans, Do you not know as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And he goes on throughout that chapter talking about this interplay between death and life, resurrection, uh, and death of our own old sins all tied up in baptism. So baptism marks us joining the resurrection, and it marks the death of our sins to God. Uh, 1 Peter 3 is kind of a... a uh, well... It's a, it's a curious statement about something else that happened at the resurrection. 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. When it says he was put to death in the flesh but made alive by the Spirit, it's talking about Easter. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, were there in the resurrection raising Christ by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. When we, when we say the creed in church, we talk about Jesus' descent into hell, that he was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. This is where the doctrine of the descent into hell comes from, right here. By whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison. The spirits in prison is hell. So Christ was made alive by the spirit. He was resurrected and at that point, descended into hell. 
and proclaimed his victory over hell. This is why we join his descent into hell, not to suffering, but to his exaltation. He was exalted in hell. He declared his victory in the capital city of the devil himself to prove he was untouchable, body and soul. Uh, and then he appears to, to his followers. So the descent into hell is tied integrally to the resurrection itself. Uh, and it was a bodily descent. All right, um, just we're out of time here, so just a couple quick points. Uh, the resurrection is a source of Christian comfort in the face of death. Uh, we read these at every funeral, the great comforting passages that Christ will raise our, our lowly bodies so that it will be like his glorious body. Um, and also the nature of Jesus' resurrected body these are the citations of Jesus appearing amongst his disciples, uh, disappearing to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. That is, Jesus, even though he was in the flesh, his divine attributes as God were able to communicate to his human flesh so that his flesh could now manifest the glory of God. Unlike Calvinists who want to say that the flesh of Jesus limits his divinity, so that when it talks about Jesus appearing to his disciples in the upper room in his resurrected form, he crawled in through a window or snuck in through an open door. He didn't just boom appear among them because somehow his humanity limits his divinity. So the resurrection story you know, disproves Calvinism too. All right, there's a lot to the resurrection. We could spend weeks there, uh, but those are some basic thoughts. Any questions? All right, let's close with prayer. Merciful Father, we do thank you for joining us to the resurrection of your Son through our baptisms. We pray this day that you strengthen right faith and life within us, that we might be prepared by your grace to receive that resurrected life in Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.